Hi, I'm Trish Colangelo, and I'd like to welcome you all to family. The topic tonight is going to be the effects of alcohol and drugs on the family system. Very often, families have no idea what happens to them, how they get affected by living with or near an, an addicted person. Very often, they become more addicted to the person. As the person becomes addicted to alcohol and drugs, they become addicted to the person. Now, it's very, it's very difficult to define that because the alcoholic drug addict, they understand when they're taking something, a substance, it changes what happens to them. Family members, we pay so much attention to the addict, we stop paying attention to ourselves. We try to make it look normal, even though it's an abnormal situation. We pay attention to a disease, which makes us feel very negative. It's a matter of paying attention and identifying what this is all about. What is the reality and what is the truth that we live with? Family members don't want to look at the truth because if they look at the truth, they might have to do something about it and they have no control over what they can do. They very often try to control everything that another person does. Their addiction is to that person. They want to know where they are, what they're doing, who they're with, are they talking, are they drinking, are they drugging? If they are, how much money did they spend, where they get the money? And they constantly perseverate about another person's behavior. When you're paying attention to someone else's behavior, you're not paying attention to your own behavior, and it makes you neurotic. You're not living in your own reality. So family members get very insidiously affected by this illness. Sometimes they say that the family member gets sicker than the addict and that really, I don't often go there very often with new families because they, they don't quite get that. But as they get more involved and learn some about some of these symptoms that we'll speak about tonight, they start to identify themselves and what happened. Seven out of ten children of alcoholics either marry an alcoholic, become one or both. That's enough very good odds in the year 2014. The other three percent, they don't get to, they don't get off the hook. What happens for them is they wind up becoming very angry people. I deal with tons of adult children in non-recovery and they have a lot of anger, they have perfectionism, they have control issues, and their life seems on the outside very successful, but on the inside there's a big hole as things are turning. We believe that alcoholism chemical dependency uh, is a physical, emotional, and spiritual illness. We also believe the same for the family. It's an emotional because of their emotions get frozen. It's physical, they start to become physically ill, they have headaches, they have backaches, they have migraines, and then it becomes a spiritual despair. A spiritual despair because their life is not going the way they want it to. They feel hopeless, they feel helpless, they will try everything to get this person to stop drinking or drugging, and that's not possible. It's an average of seven years from when a person, a family finds out that there's a problem to when they do something about it. Seven years is the average, and seven years is a very long time. I often say to families, what other disease would you live with? What disease would you live with? Would you live with diabetes or someone having a cold and say, you know, I'm going to take care of it in the house, shut the door, close the windows. We don't have it. Not with alcoholism. It needs to be treated just like any other illness does. And all too often when it's not, the family winds up having distorted thinking, poor judgment. They don't know what's going on, but yet they're going to fix what's happening. They want to rescue the person, control the person, fix the person, and that's not going to happen. So they kind of Pay, they pay so much attention to the person, they're not paying attention to not only themselves, but the rest of the family members. One alcoholic affects five to seven people, a drug addict, and five to seven people in their daily lives. That's a lot of people. They estimate there's 18 to 21 million people in America with alcoholism chemical dependency. Now, if one of those persons affects five to seven, we're talking about over 100 million people. And everybody said the same thing, not in my house, not in my family, because all the shame that this disease brings to it, the, the shame, the guilt, uh, still in the year 2014, still has all that stuff going. And every person, every member of that family feels they caused it. You know, if it's the mother, it's her fault. If it's the father, it's his fault. The, the husband, the wife, it doesn't matter what the relationship is. And brothers and sisters, they suffer terribly with it because they're watching a person who is very close to them. Brothers and sisters are the strongest relationship we have. And they're watching the person that they love going down the tubes. Brothers and sisters very often know more about what's going on with the addict in the family than, than the parents or perhaps somebody else because you hear it in the school grounds or you hear it from kids, oh, I saw your brother, I saw your sister, you know, they were acting like whatever, 
whatever they're acting like, usually not very nice, but that's, and then the person becomes embarrassed, embarrassed. So all the relationships that we have get affected by this illness. Sometimes it's perhaps the nearness geographically, they live close by and you get to see them. Sometimes you don't live close by, maybe sometimes you move to California, so I want to get away from all that. And they're only taking themselves with them. People that live in California or people that live wherever they live still have the effects. That person lives inside of them and they think about them every day, wonder how they're doing, wonder what they're doing, wonder if they're okay. Many people have suffer sleepless nights because of it. You know, is the person going to come home? It's two o'clock in the morning, it's three o'clock in the morning, and the person's not come. So, family members, very insidiously, they start, they don't understand that that's the effects of what happens to them and what they can do about it. They have no idea that there is hope and there's help out there. So fortunately, we have the opportunity to be able to say, here's some characteristics, here's some behaviors. And some of the uh, characteristics I'm gonna speak about today, I have seen over the course of years break down people's denials because it helps them understand, is that what they're talking about? Is that how I got affected by this illness? It's not any big to-dos, it's all the everyday stuff that we do. And, and instead of doing what we can do the best to our ability, we do it halfway or we don't do it at all because we're paying attention to, are they home, are they not home, are they gonna get home? You know, the alcoholic, chemically dependent person thinks three things. When they're gonna get their substance, then they're under their influence of their substance, and when they're gonna get it again. Family members, we parallel that. We're always wondering when the person's gonna have their substance, what we're gonna do, well, if they're under the influence, what are we gonna do with them, and when are they gonna use again? So our preoccupation, if you will, is with what they're doing and what they're not doing, what they should be doing, and it, we perseverate about it until we neglect our own, our own other children, perhaps, or our relationships that we have. So let's take a closer look at some of the symptoms and behaviors of what happens to families living in addiction. What is the protective stage? The protective stage is where families want to keep it a secret in the home. It's the secret everybody knows, but they want to, they think because of their denial that no one knows what's going on, but everybody knows. By this point, we think it's early, early stages, but per persons on the outside have taken a look and perhaps their work now has been a little bit affected, their schoolwork, whatever it might be. But family members were steeped in denial. It cannot be that. We say it cannot be chemical dependency, it can't be smoking weed, it cannot be that because we're so afraid that that's what it is. I've dealt with many parents that they would rather have their child mentally ill than addicted because of what, it, what society says, that an, an addict is worse than someone with mental illness. So we have to find out through the protective stage, we have to break down the confusion and get to clarity about what is this about. If a person had any other illness, we would be jumping right in there and taking them for, for chemotherapy or taking them wherever they needed to go. But now we say to them, this is addiction, and everybody wants to put their, their head under the uh, under the covers or put their head in the sand and they do not want to have an addicted person in their family. And I think that one of the reasons as I work with so many families is that they're embarrassed, they feel that they're the ones who caused it, and that they're the ones who need to fix it. So immediately we start with families and we say to them, you did not cause al alcoholism, chemical dependency, you cannot cure it, nor can you control it. And when they start to understand those three things, but I also add that there is a fourth C, that they can contribute to it by their behavior. So many of them are enablers, if you will. They do for a person what the person should be doing for themselves. And that's very simple things as far as minor things of waking them up in the morning and they wake them up four or five, ten times until they're ready to pull their hair out and the person's like, well, what's wrong with you? You know, wake me up. Uh, or their laundry. Or I had a woman one time and she was saying, I don't know how my son got here. She said, I did, I did everything for him. Then I said, well, what did you do, Mrs. Smith? She said, well, he lives down the street from me and he comes in the morning, he drops his laundry off and then on his way home, he picks his laundry up, all nice, folded, nice and neat. 
She said, I sometimes feed him. She said, he doesn't always eat dinner with me, but she said, I give him food. And then she said, and I also give him auxiliary money. Now everybody that was standing around, they wanted this lady's address, right? Food, auxiliary money, and, and laundry being done. Who wouldn't want that? So I said to her, who is your son? And she said, oh, Tommy. I said, Tommy who? She said, Tommy Smith, and she was very proud. And I said, well, how old is Tommy now? Oh, my Tommy's 42. I said, well, Tommy needs to start to grow up. Tommy needs to take responsibility for himself. And you need to get out of denial that Tommy can't do his own laundry or take care of himself. He's a grown man. You know, very often with this illness, people don't grow up, they just grow old. They don't want to grow up. They have what they call the king baby syndrome. And they want what they want when they want it. And us family members, because we're so, so feeling that we created this, that we give them whatever they want. And that's, that's not going to work. So the confusion and the denial and the embarrassment that we have just goes on and on and on. We do whatever they want, and then we get embarrassed by it. We get embarrassed by their behavior if their you know, name is in the newspaper for a DUI or for something, a court appearance. And then all of a sudden they want to isolate and they, they don't want anybody to talk to them. They don't want anybody to know. And they used to have friends and now their friends are going by the wayside because some of their friends might even be saying to them, you know, your son or your daughter has a problem. And it's like, no, that, that person's checked right off the list because of the, of the denial. And the preoccupation, of course, comes in because the whole thing is run by fear. The, the bottom line and how people feel is fear. Fear of what? I say, what is your greatest fear? Now, of course, if you love an alcoholic or a drug addict, your greatest fear is that they're gonna die. That would be anybody's fear, that's a natural, but there's no way that we could by doing their laundry or picking up after them or taking them to the police station to pay a ticket, that's not gonna change anything. That's not gonna change their addiction. That's only going to help them not do what they need to do for themselves. So with the fear that we have, we also say it's fear, face everything, take a look at it and recover. Don't, have, don't get stuck in the fear of future events appearing real because family members, we always think the worst, Something's gonna, something bad's gonna happen. Now with this illness, that's predictable that something bad will happen. This disease comes with a very high consequence and very high price to pay. And some people do die from this illness. This is an illness that if you have it 100% left untreated, is fatal, is fatal. And, and family members, we try everything not to get this person to die. The illusion is that we have that control that we don't have. So then we get irritated and all of a sudden, all that fear gets pushed down inside and by their behavior, we become irritated. And then they say to us, get off my back. I'm not a drug addict, I'm not an alcoholic. I can quit, I can quit any time. I don't have to have this. And so the family member says, well then quit. And for that very moment, very often, they'll say, I, I can quit, I'll quit. And they do quit. Stopping is not the issue with addiction. It's how to stay stopped. And we family members, when they say, I'll quit, we believe they're gonna quit. And the next thing you know what happens is they come in drinking or drunk. And we're like, I thought you quit. But then they make up some, Ill, some excuse about what happened. You know, somebody at work, you know, irritated me, or, you know, you didn't, you know, make me steak, I want a chicken, whatever it might be, any excuse, any excuse. And then all that fear that we have inside just creates that buildup of not wanting to say one word to them. Family members, we do quietly peace at any price because we don't want the person to drink or drug. We don't want them mad at us. We don't want them to, to make any ruffles. And this is in the early stages. This changes as we go on, but for right now, the early stages. Sometimes when a person stops using, we have what we call euphor euphoric period, where everybody's happy. Everybody's happy, and they consider it was alcoholism instead of alcoholism, that the person's never gonna do that again. So the spouses are happy, the children are happy, everybody's happy. And then one day the person drinks her drugs and everybody goes down, we get disappointed and then we get guilty. They liken it to a merry ground named denial. That's what it's called, alcoholism, chemical dependency, a merry ground named denial. As the merry ground is going around, the horses are going up and down and that's what happens. We have these good times and we have these bad times. Everybody living with addiction is not terrible, awful things. Good things happen as well. And that's part of the confusion of it because we think, well, this is a really, really good person. We're not, we're not questioning their personhood because they are good people. You know, the profile of the alcoholic, chemically dependent person is they're 
more sensitive than most people, they're more creative than most people, and they're smarter than most people. So as family members, we're like, ugh, because we're watching them. The frustration of watching a person that has all these capabilities and talents going down the tubes and using a drug or alcohol to alter their mood. And then if they're in a good mood, every, all the family's in a good mood. And if they're in a bad mood, the family takes on that mood. We don't even have our own moods. Some people refer to it or liken it to, co to codependency, that we're so paying attention to how a person feels and how they act and what they do, that that's what we become. We become like they do, certainly without the alcohol and the drugs. But as we move on, everybody gets disappointed because we thought life was going to be normal again. We thought everybody was going to be okay. So we get disappointed. And with that comes the guilt. What did I do to create this to happen? And the guilt is one more time that we think that we did something. And the, the people that started together as a, a loving harmon, harmony relationship, they wind up bitter, angry, and mad all the time at each other. And that's a difficult way to live, not only in that environment, and then some of them even raise children that way. But we keep spinning around and around and around, like that merry-go-round keeps going around and around and around, because somehow or another we think we're going to effect a change, effect a change by saying one more thing. And we say, let me say one more thing. Let me put it this way. Maybe they'll hear it that way. It's the illusion. It's not the truth. We say to families when they come to see us, you need to find out what the truth is. What the truth is, not only about this illness, but what happened to you? What are the effects that happened to you? And as I mentioned before, these symptoms that I'm speaking of are one of the best to break down denial. Because when you tell people, you know, you were, were you ever embarrassed? Did you have confusion, denial, preoccupation, fear, guilt, and resentment? They say, yes. I said, you know what resentment is? Resentment is always thinking about what happened. What happened, what happened? Look what he or she did to me. And that's where families live in the past. And they keep resenting. You know, in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says resentment is a luxury to an alcoholic. And I believe working with families of the years that I have, that resentment is also a luxury to a family member because resentment creates a person living in the past and it creates a lot of problems to their insides because it eats people up. Some people, sometimes people say to me, well, you know, I've had it up to here with this person. Well, if someone says to me, I've had it up to here with this person, I can handle that. But the person who's so full of resentment says, I'm up to here, I run because it's like, whoa, they're about to blow. They have all that buildup inside, all that fear and, and resentment about how, how did I wind up here? What's a nice girl or guy doing in a situation like this? How did this happen to me? And we get very, very resentful. So we start to lie. We start to lie. We lie when the truth would suit us better. And we lie all the time. And who sees us lying? Sometimes our children, what do we say to our children? Tell me the truth, tell me the truth. I can handle the truth, don't lie. And what do the children see in an alcoholic, chemically dependent family? Everybody's lying. The alcoholic lies, again, when the truth would suit them better. But what happens is the kids see the dynamics of, you know, the mother or father sitting on the couch, someone calls and says, oh no, they're not home. And the kid's like, well, they're sitting right there. So we lie. We lie. And then the children say, I thought we're not supposed to lie. And then as, as adults, because we have a different filter than children, we say, oh, it was only a little white lie, which means what? Right? A little, a little lie to a child. A, a lie is a lie is a lie. So we're giving them different messages. The messages that we teach in a chemically dependent family are not only taught, they're also caught. And kids catch this stuff. They don't know that it's alcoholism or drug addiction. They know when daddy drinks or mommy takes pills, something changes them. But they don't know what happens to the non-alcoholic. And over the course of time, I have seen where very many people that grow into the adult world, they're angry they had an alcoholic parent, for example, because they didn't have the same house all their friends had but they're angrier at the non-alcoholic because the non-alcoholic is not there for them. They're not there, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Children growing up are supposed to have guidelines, they're supposed to have rules, they're supposed to have protection from both parents, and in addiction that just doesn't happen. Nobody is watching the kids, they're growing up themselves. Generally the oldest child, sometimes known as the hero child, will be the, the child who's in control in the house. 
Alcoholism usurps our childhood. Chemical dependency takes it away. And it makes us try to be the adults as children in the home. And that's not, that's not the children's job in the home. It's the parent's job in the home. But when there's an addiction problem, nobody's in charge. So what happens as we move on with the lying? We wind up isolating, not wanting to see our families, not wanting to see our friends because we think they're all talking about us or we think they're going to tell us to leave him, leave her, kick them out of the house, get rid of them. That's not what we want as family members. Family members love this person. It's not about love. We also suffer with revulsion, which is a very difficult thing for people to talk about because we're talking about somebody that we love, whether it's our parents or our siblings or our husbands or wives, and when they walk in the door drinking or drug looking, they're not the same people. They don't act the same, they don't talk the same, they don't smell the same, and our stomachs kind of turn because here's a person that we love, whether it's our child that we nurtured as a, as a baby or a husband and wife that we walked down the aisle with or our parents that we adored, they're not the same people, and it just turns us into a different person and a different reaction when we see them coming. With all these things going on inside of us because we keep them stuffed inside, we stop losing our ability to be creative. We don't have any initiative to do things. We fall into a depression, if you will, because we don't know what, what to do. So we have to uh, figure out we, any knitting we did or making boats or whatever we might have done creatively. Uh, musicians very often, they stop playing their instrument and um, it's, it's sad. They go into a depression, they push it aside and it's almost like, you know, everybody has a 50-yard dash. They say, okay, I want to do this, I want to do that, I want to, you know, I'll go to, to, to the store and get a new hobby and I'll get my mind off what's going on in the house. And they get it home and they don't have the energy to do it. But in spite of everything else, as a family, we are protective people and we are going to protect even though anybody says anything that they want to. And sometimes we hear things, you know, sometimes people come up to you and say, oh, I saw your husband last night, or I saw your son and your daughter, or whatever it might be. And they, we, we protect them. They say, oh, well, they were sick, or they're coming down with the flu, or we make up stories. We go back to those lies. In spite of what anybody says, we will protect them. And we'll protect them when they don't need, when they shouldn't be protected anymore, when, they, when we need to have a person come up and say, you know, this is the problem, you need to do something about it. But we go into a protectiveness. And again, with all that energy being displaced to one person, we start getting psychosomatic ailments. Something is wrong with us. You know, we have feet problems, we have back aches, we have headaches, we have acid reflux, we get stomach problems. There's something always wrong with us. So we go to the doctor and we say, you know, we don't feel good, you know, my moods are swinging I just don't know what to do with myself anymore and very often family members are diagnosed bipolar now are some family members bipolar absolutely yes but all the family members that are being diagnosed out there and it's because they don't when they get to the doctor and they say I have all these I don't feel good they never say to the doctor I'm living with addiction they don't they don't mention that part of it they just say I don't feel good and then they get diagnosed bipolar now when I see families and they are on bipolar medication I say you need to see a doctor we never tell them to get off of medicine that's not our job but we do help them see that some of these things that they have stuffed inside of themselves is creating the depression it's creating the aches and the pains they just never feel good so they stop isolating with people they stop they stop being friendly toward their neighbors. They, they sometimes neglect their children. And neglecting their children, I don't mean not feeding them or not, but they don't play with them. They don't talk to them because they're so busy, either paying so much attention to what the addict's doing and when are they coming home and the children, they just don't know what end is up. So they just kind of go about their merry way. And then all of a sudden they are 14, 15 years old and guess what happens to them? They're doing the same thing that they watched happen to all their lives. And then they're trying a little weed or they're, they're smoking or they're drinking and, and then everybody in the house is like, whoa, what happened here? And very often that child is then what we call the scapegoat. They get scapegoated. Everybody's looking at that child as causing the problem in the home rather than who is the alcoholic or the drug addict that's who's creating the havoc now we also say to families it's not their fault the person who becomes an addict they didn't ask for that to happen and I always pull when I uh, talk to groups of people sometimes who are uh, recovering from alcoholism and drug addiction I say to them how many of you decided what day did you decide and what was your goal to become a drug addict or an alcoholic? Never raises a hand. No one ever raises a hand because that's not what they intended to do. 
but it's just what happened. So we say to the family, they're trying to blame the addict, the addict's blaming the family, and actually, there's no blame because what happens is this disease entered in the home uninvited. It acts like a huge elephant in the living room and nobody says, hey, we have it here because we're afraid. We're afraid because we can't fix it. We don't know what to do. So we act as if it's not there. People walk around that elephant and then they stay in that denial and they walk around the elephant and act as if nothing's going on. But there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. We, so we don't feel good, and then we wind up with uh, sympathy, genuine pity. The people that we love, we're watching them drink or drug themselves to death, and that's a true sadness. And we have pity for them, and we have sympathy for them. Now, of course, different relationships, as we walk through these characteristics and symptoms, deem different ways to behave, different levels of intensity, different durations of time. So everybody doesn't feel the same thing or all of these. They say if you have two or more of these, you're in. But as we walk through some more of these, we're going to go into the later stages. Now, some of you might be in the later stages. So we will address what that looks like. What I just spoke about is the early stages of addiction and this disease is progressive and it will just keep moving along with every member of the family, each getting affected in a different way because like I said, different relationships, different intensities and different, different um, durations of time. But everyone living with alcoholism, whether the nearness of it geographically, it's always an emotional, and everyone gets affected by this illness. So let's take a look at the later stages and, and see, see what we can do in regards to breaking down perhaps some of the denial. The later stages is also known as the controlling stage because now everybody is feeling out of control and the more out of control they feel, the more they need to control their outsides. Their insides are out of control, their outsides they need to control. So they start to control everything and everybody. Um, that is part of what happens to them. It's part of what happens to them because they feel the need to, con to control everything and everybody starts to run away because they're always saying what they should do, what they have to do, what they're supposed to do. And, you know, the addict doesn't want to hear that, nor do the other family members. So we go into an inner rage and panic. You know, many, many family members have panic attacks because they have all the stuff stuck inside of them. They're angry. We call it rage because rage is a whole lot more than anger. It's all the angers that are built up, all the years of perhaps living with this and never really dealing with it, never talking about it, just putting it inside deeper and deeper. Also, anger turns into a sadness, a depression, um, because people are depressed. They're watching a person that they love, the person, as I mentioned before, how smart they are and how sensitive they are and how creative they are. They're watching them go down the tubes. And that's a sad thing to watch because they're watching all their, all their talents just being drunk or, or drugged away. So we go into the sadness and we feel that somehow or another that um, maybe one more time, one more way, maybe we just keep crossing that line. We say to them, you know what, this is the line. Here's the line and the next time you cross it, this is what's gonna happen. And sure enough, with chemical dependency, that line will change. And then the family member says, you know, the next time, the next time you do something, this is gonna happen. And sure enough, that line changes. Well, every time we change the line, we're changing the traditions in our family, we're changing everybody else's values in our family for, for the addiction. And that's not gonna work. We keep changing people, places, and things, and that doesn't work either. So we walk into this and we get depressed, we go into rage, and, and family members very often, with, when they don't deal with all the, all the um, characteristics and behaviors of living with addiction, they wind up very, very angry. And they stay angry because they stay in the past and all the collection of the early stages that we spoke of now come to fruition and they become very angry. So people say, you know what, no wonder why I drink or no wonder why I drug or no wonder why I leave the home because this house is not happy. People are most comfortable in their own homes and when you want to be out of your home, there's a problem in the home. And then, then we go into this frantic pursuit of outside activities because outside the home, people are saying, you're really good, you did great, you know, your classroom mother, you're ahead of this, you're in charge of that, and you get pats on the back. Inside the home, 
you're not getting pats on the back. Inside the home, there's a lot of arguments, a lot of debating, a lot of you never can do anything right, a lot of criticism, a lot of judgment. So family members, then we want to run outside the home because we don't like what's going on on the inside of the home. And then who's suffering? One more time, the children are suffering. And the children are suffering because now both parents are not available. Neither one is available. One's drinking or drunk, drugged, and the other one is so angry that they don't even want to take care of the children. Sometimes they leave the home and they go out to work. You know, workaholism goes hand in glove with alcoholism. And so the non-alcoholic or non-person uh, taking drugs, they, they go out the door and they go out to work, leaving the children, again, one more time to fend for themselves. And as this disease progresses, the children just become more and more the role to the caretakers in the home. The older child takes care of the younger children. The younger children get mad about that. They say, hey, you're not my boss. You're not my mother. You're not my father. You're not, you're not in charge of me. But the older children believe they are in charge of them because the adults are not there for them. They are somewhere else, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Just as this affects the alcoholic, chemically dependent person, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, it also affects the family the same way. So then we want to be out the door all the time. And after that, we wind up emotionally emotionally and physically drained. Everybody's sick and tired of being sick and tired. And it's truly whoever gets home first and gets the couch. And then they say to the, to the children, call again for pizza. I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. There's a book by Philip Hansen called Sick and Tired of Being Sick and Tired. And as I mentioned before, if someone said to me, I'm up to here, I can handle that. When they say we're up to here, that's when you run. Because they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And everybody gets to be that way and then they take refuge on the couch and no one is taking care of the children. No one's helping them with the homework, no one's saying, do you have a test tomorrow? No one's helping them with projects. And the house becomes very often chaotic. Now sometimes chaos comes in a silent form as well, but sometimes there's loud voices, sometimes there's a violence in the home, and sometimes it's just that quietness, that the feelings not only are taught in the home, they're caught in the home. And kids feel, I must be doing something wrong here. This must be my fault. So now the next generation is going into, this is my fault. And then the kids start picking up that it's their fault. And how can I do this better? How can I be a better kid? How can I like get straight A's instead of a B plus? Or how can I please them? Because they seem to be so displeased with me. So then they run faster and harder. Now other children in the house feel, well, if I'm not gonna make them happy, I'm not gonna make them happy. So I might as well try. I might as well try what Joey offered me in school, a little shot of, of whatever it was or some, uh, some weed. I might as well try that and see what happens. So that, ch that child sometimes takes that path. The older child's trying to keep everybody together. And then sometimes with third child comes along and they're the child who says, I don't want any part of this family. You know what, leave me alone. You're all crazy, just leave me be. They'd rather be with their pets than with their family. And they isolate, they go to their separate rooms, and it's, they have the attitude, just leave me alone. So they have trouble with intimacy later on in their life because all they did was talk to animals or have imaginary friends, or they're so involved with their books, computers, whatever it might be, that they did not have much interaction with people. So they just kind of, this is the, this is the uh, brother or sister that can move to Nome, Alaska, never to be heard from again, because they were so disconnected from the family. Addiction disconnects people. And if you look at like a dollhouse, every room has different, every room is taken up in this family by other people. There, there's no cohesiveness. There's no, let's watch TV together or whatever it might be. There's somebody sitting in the family room, no one's sitting in what, the living room, right? and everybody's just split and splintered. There's not much cohesiveness. There's total disconnection in the families of addiction. So then family members say, sometimes the alcoholic chemically dependent person says to the family member, come join me. You, you, you became like you don't want to have fun anymore, so come with me. And they go out sometimes with the person, and then they, it doesn't do for them what it did for the alcoholic chemically dependent person. And they have this anti-chemical attitude. When you have an anti-anything attitude, it's, it doesn't work very well in this in this world, but they develop that and they blame the person's friends, they blame the teachers, they blame everybody, but really what's happening in their own home. And again, that's to take the focus off of them. They're still feeling very, very guilty at this point. They're really feeling 
that they are responsible for what happens in their family. Now, people need to be accountable for what happens in their family, but when you have addiction and you're so out of control with everything, it's very hard. It's very hard to try to put all these pieces back together and tell everybody they're okay. People are being judged. People are, so the criticism is amazing. You know, the parents might go out and they leave the, the child a list of 10 things to do. The kid does eight. They come home and the parent sees the two that wasn't done. And then all of a sudden, they get back to, they're criticized, they're named, they're called names, they're like, oh, you'll never be any good, you couldn't even fill, fill this list that I gave you to do. And the child starts to feel more and more smaller, more and more inferior, and then one more time, they either try to dance faster with their schoolwork, they go into their room, lock the door, or if it's the child that starts to look perhaps at using chemicals to get some relief from all the confusion in their life, then we have two people. We have one adult in the family and a child off to the races with addiction. And then the person that is in charge of the home, which is, we're, we're not quite sure who that might be at this point, then they start really dancing because now they have two people in their home that are addicted and they don't know what to do. So they walk into hopelessness. They're hopeless. How can this happen? What am I going to do? They have a spiritual despair. They have that hole. They have that black hole, and which is filled with, at this point, with a lot of anger, but emptiness. Like, how can I change this? A spiritual despair. They're looking to the addict, if you will, as their higher power, which doesn't work very well because that person has clay feet, and that's not going to work for them. We start using ourselves. We start using chemicals ourselves. And that doesn't work because very often as you walk out the door and you walk back in with a hangover the next day or whatever, it's like, you know what, that's not going to work for me. And we stop using. Sometimes, though, I see family members, they walk into addiction themselves because anybody that takes an addictive substance for any length of time can and will become addicted to it. So as a family member starts to take, they start taking medicine for relief. They go to the doctor. They t they wind up on medication for them to sleep at night, for them to, you know, just calm their nerves or for wherever it might be. And then we, again, we're dealing now with two addicts, alcoholics, and someone on pills. So we're wondering what's going to happen to this family? What's going to happen to this family? And what happens to this family as time goes on is that they're going to keep repeating this generationally over and over and over again until we wind up with a desire to punish. We want to punish people because we feel that the addict is punishing us by acting this way, by causing all these symptoms, the embarrassment and the confusion. So we want to punish them. And very often, family members, we use, we use all different things to punish the person that we perceive is hurting us. Hurt people hurt people, and everybody's hurting right now. So we will, sometimes you have a 16-year-old daughter come home pregnant, for example, or you have your son who was the star football co football team and the captain of the, of the team, and he comes home and he says, oh, I quit that, I hate that, I'm not gonna do that. And you have been dreaming of that he was going to, you know, get a scholarship, or he was going to make you feel worthy. Sometimes parents live through their children, uh, especially addictive parents, because because they know they're failing. They know they're failing everything and everybody, including themselves. So they're gonna to look to the outside to get some kind of self-worth, and they'll look to their children. So when this child comes home and says, I'm quitting, I'm out of here, what's gonna happen? What's gonna to happen to the family? They have this revenge impulse. Well, if you're gonna do this, then I'm gonna do that. And if you think you're gonna get away with this, I'm gonna do that. So everybody in the home, of which we're supposed to be in harmony, living in a serenity, living in peace, living in cooperative spirit, doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And as this progresses, we have three things, three things we've taught our children. Don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. Very uncommunicative. There's nothing going on. Very nice with communication. We're all talking about nothing. They're not talking at all about anything. Or we're talking about things that a person did, constant. As I mentioned before, family members speak about the past all the time. And sometimes we speak about the past because we want the person to understand what they did so they will change. We're constantly thinking about how we're gonna get another person to change, how we're gonna get another person to stop taking chemicals, or how we're gonna get this person to do what we want them to do. Because life is not good 
Life is not good. We get so distrustful of everybody. We have an uneasiness to change. We don't want anything to change on the outside. Everything has to stay the same or we wind up changing everything, which isn't so good either. Sometimes we separate. Sometimes we say, I'm getting out of here. You know, we have a temporary separation. And if um, at this point we have a person leave the home because it's parental alcoholism and they want to, they hope that they, that they pick the right person to marry, but guess what they wind up doing? They leave the home, they, they say, I'm getting married, and they generally marry the same thing they just left, but perhaps has a different face. Alcoholism has very long tentacles, and it goes right through generations of the repetition of behavior over and over and over again. So if, if it's the wife and husband, if they want to get out of the home, then they wind up divorcing, and they're going to do the same thing. They're going to marry um, another alcoholic, chemically dependent person. It's called compulsion repetition. We're doomed to repeat our behavior unless or until we recover from it. And family members as a whole are very, very hard pressed to understand we need a recovery. We believe that the alcoholic chemically dependent person is the only person in the house that needs to change. That once they change, we are okay. And we're far from okay because we have all these things, all these resentments and all these uh, old memories and old tapes that keep playing in a negative way. So we wind up one more time trying to take control of the whole situation and trying to be res we're totally responsible and controlling. And that's what we wind up doing, taking control of everything and everybody. So much so that family members are like, you know, don't go there because every time you do, there's something wrong with you and don't want to change it or whatever it might be. When you feel a need to control somebody, you're out of control yourself. And again, family members, they don't get that in the beginning. They're very hard pressed to understand they need a recovery. They know who needs the recovery and it is not them. So as we take a look at some of these symptoms and some of these characteristics and behaviors, if any of you have identified any of these, we have some resources for you to, to call, to talk to people. Talking is the best therapy because talking not only helps you uh, identify what happened to you, it also helps you start to heal and get some clarity about what you're dealing with. Very often when we deal with family members and we, we talk to them about what happened to them, they, were, they said, "How you, you lived in my house, how did you know all this? Years of doing this, years and years of seeing family members and identifying their behavior and seeing them heal. Family members can heal. Family members can heal whether the alcoholic or chemically dependent person does or not. That's scary to them, but sometimes the person doesn't recover. The, on the other hand though, the alcoholic, chemically dependent person, they need to recover whether the family does or not. The ideal situation is everybody heading in the same, same way, the same time, getting to a 12-step program of recovery and helping them sort out things that um, they need to sort out in order to get clarity, in order to get peace, in order to identify that this is not the way you have to live. This is not the way you have to live. You're not meant to live this way. You, it hurts your brain. You have to understand what happened to you and move on. Forgiveness is part of this recovery. Understanding is part of this recovery. That's why it's so important for family members to go get help for themselves, regardless of what the alcoholic, chemically dependent person does. I would like to thank everyone for coming out tonight.